Hey, I'm pro saxophonist Jamie Anderson. You're watching Get Your Sax Together. Now look, I absolutely love our saxophone community. It's really the best, isn't it? But let's be honest, we do get a little bit set in the way we think about things. We take some sacred truths as immutable. Now recently in the Inner Circle membership, I interviewed Jack Tyler from the Boston Sax Shop and he helped dispel some of these myths. We've got three of these myths to dispel today and I think you're going to find some of them quite shocking. So let's start with myth number one. The first myth is that materials affect sound. And it makes sense, right? Everybody thinks the legendary Mark VI is made from, you know, gunmetal and you can never get another saxophone that sounds like it and all the rest of it. You shouldn't get a lacquered, you know, vintage horn because it won't sound as good as an unlacquered. We've all been there. Mouthpieces, metal mouthpieces, you know, uh, versus hard rubber mouthpieces. You know what I'm talking about. So I asked Jack if the metal of the Mark VI was very important to its sound and therefore could never be recreated. Here's what he said. So it's nothing to do with like the old metals different or no. Nah. No, no. And and like that whole thing, I've never, I mean, it's fun to think about it as a myth, but you know, the saxophone, uh, it doesn't produce sound by vibrating, right? It does vibrate, but that has nothing to do with how it sounds. So the metal, the materials, the finishes, um, not to be a buzzkill, but it, it really doesn't matter. You know, it's cool and that's worth something, but it, it doesn't affect the tone. No, people thought that the Mark sixes were better because they were made from old tank casings. From old board- <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all, it's silly, you know, it's okay. just silly. So who knew that it matters so little what finish you've got on your saxophone or what it's made from. So all these people that are like, oh, it's silver plated. It's going to be bright. You know, it's, it's been relacquered. It's going to be dark. It turns out that there's very little evidence that that is actually true. Now, what about mouthpieces? What about the material of the mouthpiece? We all know that hard rubber mouthpieces are darker, right? And metal mouthpieces are brighter. <laughs> I asked Jack about the material that mouthpieces are made from and if it makes any difference. If you had an identically shaped mouthpiece in metal and hard rubber and plastic, would it make any difference? Do you know who's done that? No. Me. I've done that. (laughs) So I've done brass, anodized aluminum, 3D printed uh, PLA, resin, and hard rubber, all identical. Every single measurement, exactly the same, same read. You know, it's so funny. I played every single one. I was like, ooh. Ooh, the rubber one is so much warmer. And then I got my microphone out and I none of them, absolutely no difference, you can tell. Because again, it's not vibrating. But Jack also followed up with a really interesting theory on why people think that metal mouthpieces actually do play brighter. Check this out. Now, uh, interestingly enough, I think that the common perception that a metal mouthpiece will be brighter is simply due to the physical shape of the mouthpiece. This has always been my theory. And by that, I mean like the last year or so, right? You look at a metal link and you look at the beak profile, significantly narrower than a traditional hard rubber mouthpiece. What happens when you go and play that mouthpiece after playing something like this? You have to change your embouchure, right? You have to make your embouchure smaller. What's that going to do? It's going to focus your airstream more. So that's always been my theory is that when you, you know, that, that, conception that a metal mouthpiece would be brighter based on the material actually has way more to do with the fact that it's smaller and you have to tighten up your embouchure, which is inherently going to make things brighter, right? Right. Interesting. I think that's all that's going down there. That's, that's, that's my theory. So what are the take home points here? What are the bullets that we can take from these bombshells, from these myths being completely busted? Well, number one, it's really important to remember that the saxophone doesn't vibrate to produce sound like a plucked string on a, on a guitar or a vibrating drum skin on a kettle drum or a drum or a drum kit. That's not what happens with the saxophone. It's only the reed that vibrates to produce sound. Okay. The, the brass of the instrument and the material of the mouthpiece isn't vibrating to produce sound. Therefore, it's much, much, much less important than you might think. So imagine um, all the different things that you can make a saxophone from. For example, there are plastic saxophones and they sound almost identical to brass saxophones.
to take home is that when it comes to mouthpieces, it's really the shape of the mouthpiece is limited by the material. For example, you can't make a metal mouthpiece in the same shape as a hard rubber mouthpiece. Why? Because it's way too heavy. It might even bend the neck of your saxophone, which is why metal mouthpieces are a different shape. And as Jack said, maybe it's the, the size of them in your mouth and what you're used to, which makes the big difference. But it's definitely not the material. All the materials sound the same <laughs> if the mouthpiece was exactly the same shape. One of the really important things to remember with all this is that people often hear with their eyes. We can be preconditioned that a vintage mottled looking saxophone with all the lacquer kind of rubbing off like a vintage Mark VI sounds better just because it looks really cool. And if you had that same Mark VI relacquered, you would think that it's kind of choking the life out of it. It's not going to vibrate and produce as good a sound. That is a complete and utter myth. So it's really important that we open our minds and realize that there's a lot more going on here than we think. In fact, there's a lot less going on <laughs> than we think. And if we just listen with our ears instead of listening with our eyes and our preconceived minds, this might open up new possibilities for us. The next thing I asked Jack about was to do with reads. Now, you might notice that some reads are filed and some reads are unfiled. Filed reads are sometimes called French cut. Unfiled reads are sometimes called American cut. And it's just around the horseshoe of the read with a French, uh, with a French cut read or a filed read. That little bit of material around the horseshoe is scraped away to a straight line. Now, here's what Jack had to say about the difference that this makes to the way the reads play. And what about, you know, filed and unfiled? How does that play into it? Doesn't make any difference. No, it's, it's, uh, how should I say? It's bullshit. Yeah. Okay. So think about it, right? <laughs> think about it. Think about it. The phasing curve starts on most mouthpieces well above the window. This is all flat up to like here. Now you tell me where that second cut is on that read. It's back here. It's not doing right. anything. It's being okay. clamped down by the ligature. It's not vibrating. It's not sealing. Yeah, it's 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 marketing. It's stupid. It, it doesn't. It, there's no physical way that that could have any effect. That's why Diodari gets to sell the same read twice. I've always joked about that because it's, it's, it's the same read. It doesn't matter, you know. I mean, it's just it's funny, but it, it's also it's also it's a testament to how as musicians, especially saxophone players, especially tenor players, uh, the visual impact has such uh, uh, a stranglehold on us, right? You see that it's different. So it must do something different, right? I mean, it's very uh, logical if you take your stuff up out of uh, the world of physics and math to look at something and say, oh, there's reduced material. It's going to be brighter. It's going to respond quicker. But then again, you look at how it actually works with the mouthpiece. Nothing is happening when you cut that little piece of cork off or uh, cane. So what are the take-homes from this myth being busted? Well, although intuitively it might seem to you that it matters, you know, the amount of material on the reed, that part of the reed is not vibrating. It's out of the picture in terms of your tone and actually makes little, probably no difference whatsoever. However, we've got kind of a um, peer conformity. We've got visual bias. We've got the feeling of expectation that it would be different, which might influence how we hear it. And all these things play into the equation. But really, I think this one, like Jack said, it's all just down to marketing. I mean, I've never really noticed the difference between filed and unfiled, although I have been guilty of saying it does make a difference and probably thinking it makes a difference as well, which is quite crazy. So that's myth number two busted, which is filed and unfiled reads. So what you're hearing here is just little short snippets of a whole 90 minute interview that we had with Jack from the Boston Sack Shop. And inside the Inner Circle membership, we have other tremendous guests all the time that are just full of incredible insights. We've had Dr. Mark Watkins explaining all about your vocal tract and what is going on inside there based on 100% scientific research. We've had inspirational players like Nigel Hitchcock, Ernie Watts, um, We've had Alexa Tarantino, we've had Adam Larson, we've had lots of different players from all different genres, we've had Andy Hamilton come on as a special guest talking about playing at Live Aid and all his famous pop solos. <laughs> and believe me, that's not even scratching the surface of the guests we've had inside the Inner Circle. Apart from everything else, which is absolutely awesome inside the Inner Circle, I would highly encourage you to go and check it out using the link that you can see there. This is a really surefire way to give your playing that new 
uh, lease of energy, that new boost of improvement that you've been looking for. And also you can hang out in the friendliest community online. So go and check out the Inner Circle and uh, learn a bit more about it. And hopefully we'll see you in there. Now let's move on to the third and final myth. The third and final myth is how important your equipment is to your sound. So I actually asked Jack to rate how important the various components of your saxophone sound are in order of importance. You know, talking about the mouthpiece, the reed, ligature, uh, neck, the body of the sax, and of course, you yourself. And here's what Jack said. A uh, player, hands down, 100%. Like, I mean, again, just like we were talking about with like oral cavity, how you support your air, um, what you've been listening to. I mean, that has more of an effect than anything on the planet. So that leads me to my next point, um, which is the reed. The reed is more important than the mouthpiece, more important than the saxophone. You can have the greatest vintage $3,000 original seven star slant on your horn. If you got a shit reed, good luck. You know, there's only so much you can do. So the reed will be next, uh, then the mouthpiece, then the horn, ligature, Sure. I mean, the ligature affects how the reed responds in your mouth. I don't think it really affects tone unless it's something really extreme, like a Robner or something like that. Did I get everything? Did I get all the factors? Uh, where does neck come in that pecking order? Oh, um, neck after mouthpiece, before saxophone, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, right. So it's, there, I mean, it's, here, it's, it's, it's literally distance, right? Yeah, the closer right. it is, the more important it is besides the ligature. Now, to illustrate this stuff, Jack also had an interesting story about when Joel Fram was up in the Boston sax shop getting his, um, he was trying to sell some mouthpieces and uh, Jack had a really interesting experience to share. So check this out. Joel Fram was up like a couple of weeks ago and he brought a bunch of mouthpieces that he's, he's uh, you know, basically selling a bunch of vintage stuff. And I was like, man, it'd be really hip if we got like a video of you playing each mouthpiece. Like that would probably be, everybody would love that. And he starts playing all these mouthpieces and like, we do like three videos. I was like, no, this is a stupid idea. You sound exactly the same on every single one. And they were super different. It was like, you know, uh, metal link soloist. And I mean, it just sounds the same. And, and once you get that together, you know, your real sound conception, um, the equipment just becomes what makes it easier to get that sound. It's not getting the sound for you. You're getting the sound. And I have definitely had the same experience myself on this channel where I've been demoing gear. And it just turns out that most of the equipment just hardly makes any difference or a tiny bit of difference that you might be able to tell, you might not. And it's all about, like Jack said, the, the gear that can make it easier for you as a player to produce the sound you want. But Jack then came up with something which I've never really thought about before, which is a really, really interesting twist on this. Check this out. When you're starting out and you don't have your voicings and your air support and an understanding of your oral cavity together, the equipment does make the sound for you. And you should be investing in better, higher quality equipment because you are relying much more on that than from or Joe Lovano, whose horn literally could be falling apart and he would sound incredible, right? When you're a beginner, you need everything to be as top quality as possible because that that is your sound so like that's why i've never understood i mean i get it from a price point but like like the student reads like crappy reads like why would you give a kid that kid needs the best reads possible so that really got me thinking that when you're a beginner and you don't have the voicing and the embouchure and the uh, air support and even the concept of what you're you want to sound like the gear does make the sound so actually <laughs> Although it seems to be more advanced players than intermediates who are obsessed with getting the best stuff, really it should be the beginners who are getting the best stuff, especially a really good read, because that's where their sound is coming from. And then later on, when you're a pro like me, you can kind of get your sound using almost anything. <laughs> so I never, I never really stopped to consider that. It's a great point. So what can we summarize from this? Well, the basic theory, apart from the ligature, the further the item is away from you, the less it matters. So you are way more important than any other factor in your saxophone setup. And then you've got the reed, the mouthpiece, the neck, and finally the saxophone. So who knew? The saxophone is actually the least important part of your sound. And it's probably the most talked about. <laughs> I mean, I know people talk about mouthpieces as well. So picture this scenario. The, all these myths being busted should teach you something. Picture this scenario. You're an intermediate player and you're searching the internet for mouthpieces, you're trying to find the right reads, you're buying filed, you're buying unfiled, you're getting yourself a replacement neck, you're looking at really expensive, you know, thousands of dollars, saxophones, 
you're choosing a finish because you know the different lacquer is going to make a big difference to your sound maybe you're even getting a high mass neck screw because that's the thing that's going to create your sound well newsflash no you've got it all the wrong way around the sound is 90 percent coming from you and then those things taper away in order of importance as they get further away from you so by the time you get to the saxophone and the finish on the saxophone even believe me this is not where you should be focusing your energies Although, you know, just to balance that, these things are important for how the instrument feels to you. And really, it's all about what makes it easiest for you to create the sound that you want. That should be the big question. What tools should you be using which uh, facilitate the sound that you've got in your head and heart and in your ears coming out of the horn? And what feels more comfortable to you? That really is the big question that you should be asking when it comes to your saxophone sound. So a final disclaimer from Jack about his opinions. He has got very strong opinions, but let's not forget, he has also got a vast wealth of experience and direct hands-on knowledge. But here's what Jack said. If you haven't noticed, I have extremely strong opinions on a lot of this stuff, but like at the end of the day, like whatever makes you play the saxophone is the most important thing. You know, right. I just hope that I've, I've been able to maybe provide a, a different lens, if you will. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> some of the uh some of the things that you know happen in this industry so thank you again. so in a way although i agree with a lot of these things it's kind of there's got to be an element of don't shoot the messenger <laughs> feel free to contact jack and have a lively debate with him and by the way jack is of course the uh the leading light in the boston sax shop which i would highly recommend all this stuff their reads are fantastic i play their nexus reads their instruments are fantastic. The repair shop is probably one of the best repair shops you could possibly find in the world. All you need to do is look at the list of incredible players who are Boston Sax Shop um, users. <laughs> so definitely go and check out the Boston Sax Shop. They make absolutely awesome products. And Jack Tyler um, is just a fantastic, friendly, and also visionary and highly skilled uh, manufacturer of awesome saxophone products. I can't recommend them enough. So that's all we've got time for this week. I hope you enjoyed seeing these uh, sacred myths torn down in flames. <laughs> and you know what the depressing thing is, but also the encouraging thing is, it's all going to come from you at the end of the day. Just find the tools that make it easier to make it happen. Like I said, this interview is just a little snippet of one of the one of the many things that you get inside the inner circle. The link is in the description. You can see the URL there. Uh, you can also go and check out my free Saxophone Success Masterclass, which is 60 minutes of intense teaching, no fluff, no guff. This is all super valuable stuff, which will transform your sax playing in two shakes of a lamb's tail. If you watched last week's video, you'll understand what I'm talking about. If you bought me a coffee, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Every little milligram of caffeine helps me make these videos for you. And until next week, make sure you practice hard, practice smart, and enjoy your music. Take it easy. <laughs>